is week three, third sermon. Two weeks ago, we saw in chapter one, we need to be motivated by the portrait of Jesus, his eternal nature and that eternal plan, motivated to obedience to him. And then we saw in chapters two and three last week that we need to be motivated by the conviction of our sin as churches and as individuals in the church, that like a good coach, that Jesus is motivating us with compliments and even criticisms that we need to take to heart. But today, we're moving from earth, which is where we were last week, and we're moving into heaven. And this week, we are hopefully going to be motivated to worship God as He is worshipped in the glories of heaven now and into the future. Now, in order to set up this message today, I want to tell you a little bit about mine and Becky's experience last Monday. Last Monday, we drove to Kentucky because we were going to give our two little grandsons their Valentine's gift. That was Monday, right? Those of you who forgot it, you're in trouble. But Valentine's. So after we spent the day with them, Becky and I took our daughter and her husband Tyler and the two grandsons, and we all went to this little Mexican restaurant in the little town that, where they live outside of Somerset. And on the wall, there was the big TV, which, you know, like in our Mexican restaurants and things around here, usually have sports playing. But this was Valentine's evening. So they had YouTube videos of old love song videos. Back from when Becky and I were young, we were sitting there and we were sort of singing the air supply breakup songs. We were singing Journey, and we had these songs. Now, not all of them were MTV videos. Some of them were karaoke videos. And our little six-year-old grandson was sitting between us, and he would just stare, and he was reading aloud the, the words of some of these love songs. And I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. We all love love songs, do we not? We love those love songs, and that sort of framed my mind for Revelation chapter 4 and 5, because when we get a glimpse into heaven through this revelation in these chapters, we're going to see that in heaven there are love songs that are being sung. They're not love songs between people. They're love songs between God's people and His angels and God Himself. And as we see the love songs of heaven this morning, I hope it motivates us to be m more excited about singing our love songs to God here on earth. And that's what I want us to see this morning, beginning in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. John writes, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, I told you that John received this revelation while living on the Isle of Patmos, which was a prison colony. And this was Sunday morning. John had not faltered to the Roman emperor's demand that he worship him, Domitian. No, John, like many other Christians of that day, refused to worship the Roman emperor. And thus, because of his faith, he was put on the Isle of Patmos. Sunday morning, what's John doing? He's privately worshiping Jesus. And it's in this moment of private worship that Jesus begins to reveal to him what the Father had given to him, and that is the revelation that we have in our Bibles today. Now, in the revelation last week, we saw things on earth, seven churches. But now, beginning in chapter 4, Jesus is basically saying to John, look, I'm going to open the doors of heaven up to you, and I want you to come up and see what's happening in heaven. Now, some scholars today believe that John is symbolic and representative of the church one day in the future who will be raptured up through the open doors of heaven. And maybe it is. I'm not saying it is or isn't. But I am saying there are differing opinions here. But one thing we do see is that John gets a glimpse of what takes place in heaven. <coughs> and folks, what takes place in heaven ought to be taking place on earth among God's people. And that's what I want us to see. He gets a glimpse that there are love songs, praise songs being sung to our God. Now today what I want us to do is in this glimpse of heaven, I want us to ask three questions related to these love songs. The first question is, who is the recipient of the love songs of heaven? And I would contend in these two chapters we see three recipients who are one. 
First of all, notice God the Father is receiving heaven's love songs. Look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4. Immediately, John says, I, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So we see John saying, there's one who's sitting on the throne of heaven, and who is that one? That is God, easily. God the Father. And notice his description of God the Father. He says that God has the appearance like a jasper and a sardius stone. In, and, and what does he mean by that? Clearly it's a symbol. And there's a lot of speculation, but I believe if you go back to Exodus chapter 28 and you see God's description of the breastplate that the high priest of Israel was to wear, the first and the last stones are the sardius and the jasper stone. And for me, what I'm seeing John doing is he is saying, look, this God who sits on the throne is the God of Israel. But not just the God of Israel. Also notice how he also describes him that there was a rainbow around the throne. Now, where do we see a rainbow in Scripture predominantly described? We go to Genesis and we see the rainbow after the flood in which God saved Noah. Now, the rainbow was God's promise to Noah and all who follow after him that he would never destroy earth again with a global flood like that. Now, was that a promise made specifically to ancient Israel? No, because Israel was not in existence yet. That was a promise made to all of humanity. So God is not only the God of ancient Israel and Israel today, God is the God of all people. And we see that in these two descriptions, symbolic descriptions John gives us. Folks, God the Father is one who receives the love songs of heaven. Secondly, though, I want you to see that God the Spirit is receiving heaven's love songs. Look in verse 5 of the same chapter. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now the burning lightnings and thunders and voices, that harkens back to Exodus. When at Mount Sinai you see the lightnings and the thunder and the dark cloud, and Moses went up the mount there at Sinai, and God spoke to Moses the law. Now this is the idea of God, but then notice the close association. The seven lamps of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Remember from two weeks ago and last week I told you the number seven is symbolic. It's not seven individual spirits, but the seven means divine completion. This is the divinely complete spirit of God. The Holy Spirit who is in the throne room of God where the Father sits upon that throne. But that's not all that we see in this part of the Revelation. Look in verse chapter 5, we see that God the Son also is receiving heaven's love songs. Verse 6, chapter 5, and John says, I looked, and behold, in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the middle of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now the lamb who was slain, who is that? For those who have been taught, it's an easy symbol. This is Jesus himself. But notice how John describes Jesus symbolically. This lamb has seven horns. In the ancient world, the horn was the sign of a king's power, his authority. And this, this lamb had seven horns. Not a picture of a real lamb, but a picture of Jesus symbolically saying, he has divinely complete authority from the Father. But then also notice he has seven eyes. The eyes in the ancient world was a symbol of the ability to see into matters and people, knowledge and wisdom. So seven eyes is symbolic of Jesus having the ability to have perfectly divine wisdom and knowledge. And then he speaks of the seven spirits. Now often we think of the Spirit of God and Jesus as separate, but we also see, like in Paul's writing, that the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, and Spirit is not limited by time and space the way the human body is. So the Spirit of Christ that is the Spirit of God, notice, is sent out into all of the earth. No limits on space, but all places, all times. Folks, what John is doing is describing who this lamb is, this Jesus. He has all power, the horns. He has all knowledge, the eyes. And he is all present, the spirit. Folks, in theology, we call this God's omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. And John is describing the third recipient who is Jesus, but Jesus is the Almighty God as well. 
So who is the recipient of these heavenly love songs? It is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So now that we understand who the recipients are, let's consider who the singers are. Who's singing these love songs to God in heaven? That's the next question, and I would contend that in these two chapters we see five groups singing these heavenly love songs. First of all, notice the 24 elders of God's people sing the love songs of heaven. We pick this up in chapter 4, verse 4. Around the throne, John says, were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. 24 clearly a symbol. Now, what is it a symbol of? I told you I'm not going to go into every viewpoint, but for me, it is a symbol of the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, the 12 apostles of the New Testament. These are the leaders of all of the saints of God. And these leaders of God's people are in heaven, and they are singing the love songs to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they're not the only ones in this place. We also see, secondly, that if you've got the leaders of the saints, then where are the saints themselves? Well, folks, I believe the sea of God's people also sing the love songs of heaven. Notice in verse 6, the first part, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. Again, many, many different views on this, but for me, I think this sea of glass, it is a symbol of the saints of heaven. All of them that have gathered together in the past, present, even into the future. Now, why do I think the sea of glass are the people of God? It's because if you go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, you see that the sea of glass is mentioned again, and on top of the sea of glass are the victorious saints of God. And the sea and the saints are synonymous together there in that verse. Then you want to look at the opposite effect. In chapter 17, verse 2, you see the harlot, which is representing the satanic movement in this world. You see the harlot is sitting upon the many waters... And the waters there, like sea, is all of the unredeemed people of earth. Then you go to the Gospels. Think about Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus would often use water and sea as a symbol of humanity. The dragnet parable and other parables, you see the dragnet running through the sea, and you bring the fish out, and they're separated. Those who are acceptable, those who are not. The sea is humanity, the fish representing those who've been judged. But think about Jesus when he came to his disciples and he invited them to follow him. What did he say? I will make you fishers of men. Now, wait a minute. If you're fishermen, where do you fish? You fish in the sea. Except you're not fishing for fish, Jesus was saying, in this sea of humanity. You're fishing for people. So we see all through the Bible how the sea represents humanity. But in Revelation, this is not just any sea. Are we back on? Hot dogs. The third group, the living creatures of God's angels, sing the love songs of heaven. Look at the second part of verse 6. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Four living creatures. Now that's a very odd, uh, an odd picture, an image. Now for me, and there's others who disagree, there's some who believe that these four living creatures are like the four corners of the earth and it represents all of creation. But I don't think so. I think the four living creatures at this point represents the leader angels of heaven. 
Why do I think it represents the angelic leaders of heaven? Because when you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, chapter 10, you see that the angels, the cherubim, are described having like these four faces. Not identical, but very similar to what we see these four living creatures being described as having a few verses later. We also go in chapter 10 and we're told that the four-faced beings of Ezekiel 1 are the cherubim. You go to Isaiah chapter 6, and I haven't read it yet, but I will. You're going to find that the seraphim are described as having six wings and flying around the throne of God. Much like you'll see in another part in this revelation, that these four living creatures have those six wings. And in Isaiah 6, you also see the song that they are singing in front of the throne room of God. And they're singing, holy, 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 just as we're going to see that these four living creatures sing. That's the reason I don't think we, what we've got here is all of creation. What we've got here are the leaders of the angelic host in heaven. And these leaders, they need someone to lead, right? Well, fourth group. The fourth group's the innumerable host of God's angels, and they sing the love song of, in heaven as well. Chapter 5, verse 11. John says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels. Well, who? Many angels... Uh, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now, if you've got 24 elders and you've got four living creatures, how many you got? 28. Not 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So who are all these others? Folks, I think in this is the heavenly course, and it's got the angels of 10,000 times 10,000, and I think we can assume also the saints. And all together, the elders are leading the saints, and the living creatures are leading the angels, and they're all singing praises to God in heaven. And you say, hey, man, that sounds wonderful. But there's a fifth group, and this one's the one that gets me excited the most. Fifth, all living creatures of God's creation sing the love songs of heaven. Notice in verse 13 of chapter 5, And every creature which is in heaven, and where else? And on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard them say, and John is saying, it's not just the angels and the saints of heaven that are singing these love songs to our God, but it is also creatures on the earth. All living beings reflect the image of God. They are singing through their life a song of praise to our God. Now beyond that, as I read this, I believe, like I said, I'm not leaning toward that this is the rapture. I, I think we are seeing heaven opened right now and in the future. And what I see is that right now there are beings, saints, there are angels, there are leaders of each group, and they're all singing, but on earth, our life sings a song of praise as well. Right now. I think that when we come together in this room and we sing to our God, our voices do not stop at this ceiling. I think that our voices rise beyond the ceiling of the roof, beyond this first heaven, and goes right into the throne room of God. And our voices, when, it, when we are bellowing out our songs of praise and love to God in this place, our voices become a part of that great cacophony of voices in heaven that is praising Him and saying, we love you so much. And it's not just even here in this room. Any of you sing praises to God as you're driving down the road? You think nobody else is hearing you, do you? And yet, what I believe that we're learning here is your voice in that car is rising into the throne room of God and joining the saints and the angels there. And I believe when you're singing in the shower and you think nobody's hearing me sing right now, in that acoustical wonderland... Your voice, if you're singing from your heart praises to God, your voice is lifting into that heavenly chorus. Now, I don't know about you, but what that does is that motivates me, understanding that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the recipient of my love songs, even while I'm here on earth, along with the angels and the saints in heaven. And that I am, not I will be, I am a part of that chorus in heaven even while I'm still here on earth. I don't know about you, but what that motivates me to do 
is I want to sing. I want to sing, sing, sing every chance I get. Now, I know lots of times in churches we think, oh, I can't sing. My voice, you know, I don't sing well. And we sometimes just sort of sit there or stand there. I'm hoping you understand that if you open your mouth, you raise your voice in a song, as, as the Word says, it doesn't matter how melodic it sounds. If it's from your heart, you're joining that heavenly love song here from earth. I don't know about you, but that motivates me. But once we understand who the recipient is, once we understand we are part of the singers, then the third question is, well, what are we singing? What are the lyrics of the heavenly love songs? And that's the third question this morning. Now, when I think of love songs here on earth, I think of two different kinds of lyrics. You think of country songs, you think of rock songs, you think of just those, those sad, sad, you know, breakup songs of air supply. You think about all these songs, and usually what you see are two types of lyrics. Number one, you see lyrics that extol the beauty and perfection of the one who is loved. Oh, honey, how I love you. Your beauty is perfect in my eyes. There's none more beautiful than you. You are just the perfect woman for me. But you extol the one you love by declaring the nature of that one, right? That's what we do in earthly love songs. But we also see love songs, especially in the country music realm, where they tell stories about the one they love. Oh, we met at this place, and we dated in this way, and we did these things together, and we married, and we had children, and, and the stories are also a way of expressing our love. Whether we extol their beauty and perfections or we extol the story of our experiences with them, both of them are great subject matter for the lyrics of love songs. Folks, the heavenly love songs are no different. In heaven, I want you to see that the lyrics there are exaltation of God's perfect beauty, and there is also exaltation of all the works of God. And this is part of the love songs of heaven. See, notice, in heaven... There's an old love song that is still being sung. This old love song, what we are given in the text, has two verses in it. We see in chapter 4. The first verse of this old love song is sung by the angels. Look in verse 8. It says, The four living creatures, each having six wings. There's those six wings of Isaiah 6, right? The each having six wings were full of eyes around and within. Notice they got lots of eyes. They don't have seven eyes. That's divine completion. But they got lots. They have been able to see into things. Very wise angels. And then notice, and they do not rest day or night. Why? Because they're saying, or we're going to say they're singing, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is who is to come. Notice the angels are being led by their leaders, the four living creatures, and I believe also all of that angelic host is joining their leaders. And notice the lyrics of their song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Now in English, we have singular superlative words. And what does that mean? It means we say good, better, best, right? If we want the superlative best, we have single words that express they are the best. In English, we would say what the angels of heaven are saying. We would say, God, you are the holiest of all. One word. But in the Hebrew language, they don't have singular superlatives. So how do the people who are speaking Hebrew, how do they express the holiest? They say it three times. Holy, holy, holy. The angels are saying to God, there's none holier than you. You are the holiest of all. And they are celebrating his character, his perfect beauty and holiness. And they're saying, you're Lord, you're master, you are almighty, there's none more powerful than you. You're, you are eternal, the one who was and is and is to come. And they are extolling the perfections of God in this old, ancient love song. Now, I'm not talking 1980s MTV old. I'm not talking 1950s old. I'm talking beginning of time, old. They are extolling the perfection of God. But now that's the first verse of this old 
love song in heaven. The second verse of this old song is sung by the saints. Notice in verses 10 and 11, the 24 elders, who are they? They're the leaders of the saints in heaven. The 24 elders, they fall down before God in heaven who sits on the throne and they worship Him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before Him saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Notice in this part, they are extolling His perfections. You are the perfect worthy one. And you deserve all of these things. But then notice, secondly, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now they're telling the story of the love song. God, you are perfect, and in your perfection, at the beginning of time, you created all things. You created the, the world, the universe, the stars. You created us. And because of what you have done, we praise you as the holiest of all, worthy of every love song that we can create. And we see the angels and the saints together are singing their praises and love to God in heaven. And it's an old, ageless love song that goes all the way back to the point of creation. And folks, we're going to be singing this love song all the way through eternity as well. But what I want you to understand, not only is the old love songs being sung in heaven, but folks, there's a new love song that's going to be sung as well. And in heaven, this new love song is going to be sung about the story of Jesus Christ. Remember, love songs extol the perfections and also tell the stories of what we know. And in chapter 5, we see a story unfolding before John's eyes. Look in verse 1, chapter 5. John said, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? Listen to the lyrics. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So John sees this scroll in the hand of the one who sits on the throne, in the hand of God the Father. This scroll that is written on the front and on the back. What is this scroll that John sees? You know, lots of times scholars say this is a, the title deed of creation. In other words, this is the Father's deed or, or testament will that he gives to the Son all that has been created. And through the Son, God will be praised. Now, and I think that's very much part of it, but I think it's more than that. It's not just the title deed, the inheritance that Jesus receives. It's also the last will and testament of the Father. You see, when we think of wills, the one who has makes a will to give to others, and he always has an executor. You all know what an executor is? That is the one that the one who has has designated that at the designated time, the will will be implemented. Now for me, I'm the executor of my father and mother's estate. I'm also the executor of my aunt's estate who had no children. Meaning that they have designated a time when they want me to implement what they have written down as their will to be done with their things to be given to whomever they so choose. They chose me to make sure that is done. Well, what we see here in chapter 5 is the Father holds up this scroll, this final will and testimony for His creation that He has made. And this scroll has seven seals on it, meaning not anybody is allowed to open this. Only the one the Father has chosen can open the seals of His final will for creation. And in verses 4 and 5, I'm not reading them, but what you see is John is bawling his eyes out. Because when he realizes what this is, he wants to know, and yet no one can come up and take it because no one so far has been seen who has been chosen. And yet, not only did John see the scroll, in verses 6 and 7 we see how John then sees the Lamb. 
He said, And I looked, and behold, in the middle of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the middle of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. We know that seven horned, seven eyed lamb, right? Jesus and the seven spirits of God, his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. But then, in verse 7, look, Then the Lamb came, and he took the scroll out of the hand of him, God the Father, who sat on the throne. There was one worthy. It is the Lamb of God who was slain. Jesus himself. He's the executor of the Father's final will for all of creation. And next week, we're going to see him open up that will, breaking the seven seals. And we're going to see what the Father's final will is for his creation. But now with that, I want you to notice, it is at this moment when John's tears have been dried up because, yes, there is one worthy, this is when heaven begins to sing. And this is a three-verse song, folks, that we are given. The first verse of this new song will be sung by the leaders of heaven. Notice in verse 8, chapter 5, Now when... The Lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. They fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And these living creatures and these 24 elders, they sang what? A new song, saying, You, talking to the Lamb, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. The leaders of the saints, the leaders of the angels, they break out in course when they see the Lamb taking the scroll and they begin to extol the worthiness of the Lamb. You are worthy. Why? They tell the story. Because you came to earth and you died for our human sin and you were raised and you are the only one who can redeem humanity out of its sin. And they, they extol His perfections. And they extol His work. And they sing a new song. Not just the song of ancient creation, but the song of current and future redemption. A new song being sung in heaven. But it's not a single verse song. It's got a second verse. And folks, the second verse of this new song is going to be sung by everyone else in heaven as well. Look in verses 11 and 12. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. Notice extolling His perfections. Worthy is the Lamb who was, now listen to the story, slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They are singing love songs all over the place. Not just for the Father on the throne, but now for the Lamb who stands before the throne. But it's not just a two-verse song. It's a three-verse song. Notice the third verse. And of this new song will be sung even by everyone in creation. Verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and also on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. All of creation, which includes who? You and me, the ones who are not yet in that course in heaven. And this is a new song. A song sung to the Lamb who is our Redeemer. And the old song is still being sung to the Creator who created all things, making our life with the Lamb possible. Now, I don't know about you all, but when I see the activity in heaven, worship and praise and song sung before our God, old and new, it gets me excited. And I want to sing. And I want to praise. And it's what should motivate all of us to do this. But I want you to understand. There's old songs being sung in heaven right now. And there are old songs that ought to be sung here on earth right now. you got a younger generation that says, Oh, those old songs, 
I don't know them and I don't want to know them. Well, that's your loss, young people, because so many of those old songs extol the beauty and the story of our God. But then you older folks, you're just as bad often. You say, oh, I just love the old songs. Oh, and you find all kinds of criticisms about the new songs. But I'm here to tell you, in heaven, there are old songs and new songs that are being sung, and so should there be here on earth. And we as a united people of God here on earth should be happy and excited to sing all the songs and join the chorus of heaven. I loved these two chapters. They are so excited. Are you motivated? We're going to sing here in a minute. And you can sit there and say nothing. That's your prerogative. But I'm hoping that these chapters have motivated you. Just make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't have to be melodic. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord and join the songs that are lifting up into heaven. And when you leave this place, hop in your car and turn on the radio. And keep making those joyful noises to the Lord. Sing in your shower. Sing on a walk. <coughs> sing as you're cleaning the dishes or as you're washing the car. Sing, sing, sing. For he is holy, holy, holy. And worthy of us.